Hello, and a very big welcome to everyone joining us today from far and wide. My name is Rosemary Batchelor. I'm a member of DM25's Coordinating Collective, and together with Michael Sinclair, we will be your hosts today. DM25 TV began during lockdown to bring great minds to bear on the pressing issues of this extraordinarily challenging time. Issues like Corona, neo-fascism, digital colonialism, love and coronavirus, as well as Europe and the EU's historic failure. But today we are excited to be launching the autumn season with a core topic for our democratizing movement, which is what kind of democracy are we fighting for? I'm handing over now to Michael Sinclair, my colleague from the Deliberative Democracy DSC, to introduce you to our special guest. Hello and, and welcome everyone. Uh, just a little bit about our title, Beyond Castles. Uh, castles in our title is a metaphor uh, for the nature of all of our political institutional design. In that castles are inclusive to few and exclusive to many. And today we look beyond to uh, deliberative democratic processes that can be a determinant on governments. A little bit about uh, the title of Mass Cell BP. Uh, Mass comes from a, a quote from Thomas Paine out of a book called The Rights of Man. There is a mass of sense lying in a dormant state which good government should quietly harness. And of course, LBP stands for Led by People. Uh, currently, Mass LBP has undertaken 37 citizens' reference panels since 2008, and as of 2019, has completed more than 30,000 hours of public deliberation by more than 1,400 volunteer participants. Uh, Peter McLeod is a former researcher at Britain's Demos Think Tank, graduate of the University of Toronto and Queen's University, writes and speaks frequently about the citizens' experience of the state, the importance of public imagination, and the future of responsible government. He is an Action Canada Fellow, a recipient of the Public Policy Forum's Emergent, Emerging Leaders Award, appointed to serve on the Ontario government's Open Government Task Force, currently serves on the board of Tides Canada, which is an environmental charity, and is elected co-chair of Toronto's Wellesley Institute for Urban Health. And lastly, I met Peter in January of this year at London University, uh, where he was part of a three-person panel um, titled uh, How to Save Our Democracies. And uh, combined with our discussions here uh, uh, on the Deliberative Democracy DSC group on citizens' assemblies, we've arrived at where we are today. So without further ado, at uh, 6 a.m. in the morning uh, uh, in Toronto, let me introduce to you Peter McLeod. Well, uh, good day, a uh, good morning here from uh, from Canada, and it's very nice, Michael and, and Rosemary, to have the opportunity to speak with you. Okay, Peter, can I start with my first question? Um, to uh, a uh, general introduction for the viewers, uh, tell us about your involvement in building the reputation of Mass LBP uh, as a leading pioneer of innovative democracy process in Canada and worldwide. And perhaps you could also tell us a bit about your funding uh, and how you work with governments in the public sector. What have been some of the high points and some of the challenges? And have your goals shifted over the years? Um, all right, so maybe a little bit of an origin story about our work then at Mass. You know, we, we have been at this for the better part of 12 years. Uh, and came out of what were two of, I believe, the most significant uh, modern uh, instances of citizens' assemblies that in many ways can be credited with helping to 
build what is now being referred to as the deliberative wave. And I'm referring, of course, to the uh, major exercises conducted in 2004 and 2006 in the Western province of British Columbia here in Canada and in Ontario. And as many of your viewers will be aware, um, first past the post electoral systems uh, can sometimes go a little flaky. Uh, and in the case of uh, British Columbia, they had a uh, profoundly disproportionate result uh, with a government managing to capture all but two seats with only 40 some percent of the vote. And this impelled the government of the day to launch an inquiry about the future of its electoral system. Now, if it had probably been five years before and if it had been a different government in charge, it would have done what governments around the world periodically do. They would have appointed a commission of the great and the good to look at this issue and prepare a tidy report. Uh, but instead, they decided to take a more innovative route, and that was to appoint Canada's first citizens assembly, made up of more than 140 randomly selected citizens who had been chosen by sortition. Uh, for viewers who aren't familiar with these processes, it's a little bit like a jury, uh, except a jury made up of dozens, or in this case, more than 100 participants half men, half women, balanced by the different geographic diversity and age range, of course, of the population, which in the first instance means that you've got a body of citizens that look a lot more like the public they're intended to represent than that elected legislature. Now, Ontario came along two years later and decided to emulate that process, also examining its electoral system, and that's when I first had my exposure to these processes. I was commissioned by the provincial government to run a parallel process for Ontario's high school students that brought them together to take a similar look at the voting system. And I'll confess, initially I was a bit skeptical uh, of these processes. I thought, oh, this is um, all well and good. Uh, but many of the criticisms that are often leveled at these processes came top of mind to me as well. Uh, would people be able to grapple with the complexity of the issues? How could all of these strangers possibly find common ground? And when I walked into the um, lecture hall at uh, York University where these, the Ontario process took place under the stewardship of a former Deputy Minister of Justice and, and Family Court Judge George Thompson, I got a very profound immersion into a quality of democratic politics that I think many of us would agree is, is much too absent from our everyday way of doing politics. Here were people who came from every conceivable background. Here are people who certainly weren't initially aligned on what they thought the best way of organizing our political life might be. And yet it was a room filled with a quality of discourse um, and uh, a, 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 an empathetic uh, temperament, a curiosity for the views of others uh, that I found entirely enlivening. And so Mass, to get to your question, uh, was simply a, a vehicle for us to initially put a bit of a hurricane glass around uh, this brief, innovation that occurred and to try and uh, stabilize that innovation with the goal of ultimately embedding the idea of citizens assemblies or reference panels of citizen deliberation as part of Canada's policy making uh, culture. And in those dozen years since we've been fortunate to run, as you've mentioned, uh, almost 40 different processes with almost 1500 citizens. Um, and we have worked with um, all levels of government in this country. So it hasn't only been high political issues like electoral reform, it's been land use planning with municipalities like the city of Vancouver. It's been working extensively with our health system, both on resource allocation questions, but also uh, to think about the introduction of what have previously been more controversial health services like uh, the opening of supervised injection sites uh, in, uh, in Ontario. Um, and we've worked on major municipal infrastructure projects, transit. Um, right now, I have the fortune of chairing a national citizens assembly 
uh, on the regulation of ultimately social media uh, and the promotion of democratic expression in the light of the prevalence of new digital technologies. So our work at Mass, which is a small organization, has been to, to try and demonstrate uh, the utility and value of these processes. And it's important to our practice, you, you said to say a little bit about, um, I guess, how we organize our affairs. It, it's, been, it's been important for us to be commissioned by government always to do these projects. There, there's no question that you know, numerous foundations might be interested in, in getting a, a thoroughgoing citizen perspective on issues of the day. But our promise to our participants has always been that they would have a fair shot uh, at genuinely impacting the policies that we're discussing. And to that end, I think it's important to be commissioned by government because after all, governments do all manner of things in order to consult with their publics. I happen to believe that many of these mechanisms often are disingenuous or at least insufficient. But the folks who turn out to a town hall meeting may have an important viewpoint, but they're unlikely to be representative of the broader public interest. And similarly, when we answer a survey, um, it's rare that we get past top of mind opinion. So, you know, I, I was uh, interested in, and um, looking forward to, to speaking with both of you because I know real focus for DM is to think about the future of democracy. And I, I happen to believe that processes like citizens assemblies, which, well, it's, it's kind of you to focus on our work here in Canada, of course, taking root all across Europe right now, I think they represent a very important down payment against the future of democracy and, and help us to more substantively involve citizens in a, in, a, in a quite significant way in addressing what are many of the most complex issues that our existing representative processes, which I also believe have tremendous merit. I think these processes are complementary. I don't think it's about one replacing the other, but I think it, it can help uh, address the sensation of polarization and exclusion that typifies too, too, too much of the citizen experience in Western democracies today. And of course, the important aspect is that they are educative, where uh, the, the, the absence of deliberation in our parliaments is, uh, apart from the absence of deliberation, that there seems nothing educative educative that happens in our uh, governments at all. And this is one of the main uh, constituents of your citizens reference panel. I, I think that's a, a helpful point to draw uh, our attention to. You know, I, I, I tend to think of these as much as public learning processes as I do anything else. And, and by learning, I really mean co-learning. It's a, a citizen expert dialogue that is taking place. And um, you know, maybe just to, to walk your viewers through the, the kind of capsule process, it begins with what we call a civic lottery. We need a, a mechanism to uh, randomly recruit a cohort of citizens. And this may sound, you know, profoundly low tech, uh, but in Canada, at least, we send out typically five to 10,000 letters to randomly selected citizens with the assistance of Canada Post. But these are letters that are unlike uh, typical government correspondence because, of course, it's asking people not only to have their say, not just to give an hour or two to an evening uh, meeting, but to volunteer upwards of 40 hours and to act as a public representative. I think one of the more heartening, uh, 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 one of the more heartening, um, I guess, results of, of this experience has been to, to disprove this idea of citizen apathy and that people are too busy and self-interested to involve themselves in a substantive way. You know, when we send out our letters, we have a five to 7% response rate, uh, which is, is quite significant. So from amongst a pool of several hundred people, we will then randomly select um, generally 36 to 48 participants in a way that's demographically balanced. But that only gets us to the starting gate. And with my team, we will develop a detailed curriculum that gives people the opportunity to become better informed about the, the issues at hand. 
Now we have to do this carefully because the easiest criticism of a process like this would be that you teach to the test. You are biasing the results and that's why we often have safeguards in place, uh, third parties who are vetting that curriculum uh, and ensuring that a range of perspectives come to the fore. And then the thing that you really can't substitute, time. You know, we have the benefit of bringing people together for upwards of 40 hours and allowing them in the space between meetings also to reflect on what they've heard, to test out different ideas, to do some of their own research, bring that forwards. Uh, but then ultimately through a process of discussing values and then identifying a set of issues and ultimately priorities, the group reaches a more or less consensus view of the recommendations they wish to put forward. And in that respect, I think citizens' assemblies are very effective at conveying to governments um, real legitimacy for making difficult choices. Sometimes these results uh, end up triggering public referenda, as we've seen so effectively in Ireland. But in, in that case, that helped the Irish Parliament overcome its own political impasse. And I think it's opportunities like that where the current um, political institutions struggle to profitably address issues, they, they, they really are stuck. And so citizens' assemblies can come along without superseding the existing parliamentary infrastructure and provide some critical direction uh, to political leaders and parties. Um, Peter, just very quickly, do you, um, uh, are you of the opinion that the, uh, the government in Canada sees uh, citizens' assemblies as an enhancement to their government? I think certainly amongst um, many municipal leaders, uh, uh, they would they would uh, agree with that. I think uh, you know within different parts of our provincial governments, I've mentioned already the extensive work we've done with health system leaders, uh, including an important. Uh, uh, issue that our federal government may finally act on, which is um, national pharmaceutical insurance. So I, I, I do believe there is a kind of growing realization uh, that processes like these are, are not um, there to uh, conflict with um, or interfere with uh, political mandates. They exist, in fact, to enhance and, and build those mandates. But I think you know, this is also a, a generational issue. I think there is a, a new cohort of elected politicians who uh, are less likely to feel challenged um, by these processes because they have a different idea of leadership itself. And, and that, that ideal of leadership is as much about listening and working with people as it is uh, telling them uh, what the, the right answer to each question should be. Well, thank you for that one, Peter. And, uh... Rosemary, would you like to follow now with your question? Thank you. Um, these deliberative processes clearly can be quite life-changing for participants. Um, but it's kind of not always obvious to see how you can share that with the wider public. But I was wondering very much about the forms of media that might um, enhance the impact of any given deliberative process. I was wondering actually about the Irish Citizens Assembly and how it had achieved this sort of shift in public uh, debate that led to successful referendum results. Um, I wondered well, if you Well, I would always that. defer to Jane Souter and David Farrell in Ireland, who are the, the great democratic empresarios and academics who have been responsible for so much of the success and uptake of Citizens Assemblies in Ireland. Um, my understanding of um, the Irish experience is that the assemblies gave voice uh, to a, a quiet majority of public opinion that was not, for various reasons, able to find expression in the mainline political parties. And so having a thoroughgoing process in one instance, a hybrid assembly that involved elected MPs sitting alongside citizens in another instance, uh, chaired by a, a very senior judge, brought uh, to Parliament a, uh, uh, an effective mechanism to talk about issues like reproductive choice and same-sex marriage 
which had just been third rails in Irish politics. And it also created a, a political forum that could be covered by the media, that could be broadcast uh, on the internet, uh, and allowed Irish citizens to see a, a calm, thoughtful exploration of these issues that created space for stakeholders on all sides of these issues to come forward and, and present their views. You know, I, I, I don't like to sort of talk down the, the sort of practice of, of parliamentarians, um, but I, I think many of them would agree that question time and, and the sort of theatrics of parliament rarely impress their constituents. And many of them would acknowledge that the best work of parliament often happens on committees uh, where there can be a little more dialogue. And I, I think what citizens see when exposed to these assemblies is something that is on the whole uh, more thoughtful, uh, more reflexive, and where people can work through their differences rather than being um, beholden to party lines. And it's the case, isn't it? There's a big emphasis on transparency. So if you're organizing deliberative assembly, then you share the kind of learnings, you share the documents, you share a lot of the process, but you can't exactly share the intimate um, process of deliberation itself, can you? Uh, I'm asking that because I'm just wondering what um, what the public forum. So you can know, this is one of the really, I think, um, stimulating questions in the deliberative space right now. Um, there's no question that for the participants themselves, again, coming from every conceivable background, various levels of act, uh, of education, various uh, uh, professional backgrounds, of course. Um, their service on a citizens assembly will likely be their single most significant and memorable political act of a lifetime. Um, and you know, there's something quite, uh, I think, captivating about that experience. You know, sadly, too many people go through their lives um, without many people really caring that much about what they think about things, one way or another. I mean, maybe some members of their family, maybe some of their colleagues, but in terms of being able to exercise a, a, a public voice, I think all of us feel quite constrained. And, and in a citizens' assembly, what we see is people uh, realizing a deeper sense of, of democratic agency, of, of personal and shared efficacy with others, um, an expanded sense of their own ability to conceptualize and, and work with um, the complex topics. And that's an enlivening experience. People walk away feeling as though they have made a difference and that they've been able to contribute something. I, I, I firmly believe that you know, people do want to be part of something bigger than themselves. They are genuinely curious and, and interested in the concerns of, of others. I think the cultivation of empathy is uh, essential to good democratic processes. And so many of us find ourselves cut off from one another without effective mechanisms in the public sphere in order to encounter difference in a way that can be less threatening. So, you know, for the, the these processes, I think, pay in that sense a very important democratic dividend. You know, with the Ontario Citizens Assembly, their academic director, Professor Jonathan Rose, I think had a, a, a wonderful um, uh, epiphany when he decided that at the end of their learning program, when they had heard from academics across Canada and around the world about different electoral systems and really, you know, managing to digest graduate level uh, material about all of the nuances of these systems, he decided that he would have a graduation ceremony and he produced certificates for people. Now, you know, he made up these certificates. There was there was no authority behind them, but he called everybody up onto a, a, a small platform at the hotel in which all the members were staying one evening, and he and he thanked them and, and he recognized their achievement. And you know, one one woman um, at the assembly, and she was not unique in this respect, uh, she teared up from the process, uh, saying that you know she had just had the experience of watching her child. Uh, a few weeks or months before graduate from high school and, and she hadn't completed high school. And now she was standing on the stage getting a certificate 
and she felt so proud to be able to take that home. Now at Mass, we have continued to produce certificates for people when they, when they complete um, a reference panel. It's a certificate of public service. And it's striking to us that, you know, every, every few months we'll get a phone call out of the blue from a past panelist saying they've lost their certificate or it's fallen off the wall in the rec room and they're wondering if they could get another copy. And I think that reminds uh, those of us who have some access to political circles and, and, and enjoy a degree of political capital, just how meaningful these processes can be. So that's what I mean by paying a democratic dividend. It, it's that people themselves have an expanded sense of their democratic fitness. And I say democratic fitness because often, you know, there's a school of thought that says the answer to our discordant politics is greater civic literacy. If people knew more about how politics work, then maybe they'd feel greater affection or at least patience for it. But I think democratic fitness is something a little different. It is a chance to flex your democratic muscles. You know, it's, it's a chance to do something more active. Um, and that is about um, finding uh, an occasion to express yourself, to do the conceptual work. I, I want to be careful, though, not to leave your viewers with the impression that I believe that all citizens want to be engaged in a permanent symposium. I think one of the reasons why citizens' assemblies work so well is that they're very intensive, but they're very episodic like jury service, it's something that most of us will never do, but those of us who do will just do perhaps once in our lifetimes, but it will leave a lasting impression about the judiciary um, and the rule of law. So, you know, I started by saying that one of the challenges in the deliberative space right now is how do you scale this up? How do we get more opportunities for more citizens to participate? And many of my friends and colleagues will argue that it should be digital um, mechanisms and platforms that allow us to involve not just several dozen people, but hundreds, if not thousands. I think there's some very obvious um, uh, drawbacks to this. I think it is difficult to cultivate that empathic relationship um, uh, online. And I think many of us contending with COVID are, are trying to be clever and finding better ways to do it. But ultimately, I think scale is to come through the popularization of these processes. Governments make tens of thousands of decisions, many of them regulatory rather than legislative. And I think when these decisions are made, there are meaningful opportunities to convene citizens. Um, I think the answer to scale is ultimately to see mature democracies hosting dozens of these processes a year, if not hundreds across the different levels of their governance. And that's what will um, ultimately make it possible for not everyone to participate, but for everyone to know someone who's participated. Thank you. That's a, a really um, comprehensive vision for us to unpick now. But I just wanted to also ask you very quickly about the clients, because you talk about their democratic literacy also being enhanced by this, this process. But, so it's not just the participants who are the well. Well, that's learners. that's just it. I mean, many people would assume that I spend most of my time in the company of citizens. Uh, really, I spend most of my time in the company of senior public servants. And you know, we have to remember that liberal democracy is fundamentally um, skeptical, if not hostile, uh, to its publics, and it has a tendency to regard publics uh, as risks. Uh, rather than resources. Uh, and so very core to our work at Mass is this, this idea that we have to shift that view of a public as a risk to be managed um, and to realize it as a resource to be tapped. I think public servants, of course, often go in uh, to their careers with the best of intentions and maybe a sunnier view of that, that phantom public. But then through repeated exposure uh, to very dysfunctional town hall meetings and the disappointing results of superficial surveys and the constant kind of customer service demands of uh, specific individuals, they, they get ground down. And so when, when we end up uh, uh, proposing one of these processes, it's often met with you know, a fair degree of, of skepticism and you know, we have to earn the trust of our clients. And part of earning that trust is demonstrating that um, the public is 
uh, uh, different than the assumptions uh, that so many of us hold. It is not so emotional and so volatile and so ill-informed um, as, as to be held at bay. Uh, that better process can lead to better policies. And I, I think many of our clients, they, they don't come to us because they're wanting to be democratic innovators. They, they come to us because they're between a rock and a hard place and, and they need some sort of mechanism to uh, address that issue. And they're willing to take a bit of a risk to do something different. And I think for many of them, it's probably one of the highlights of their careers, just as it was originally a highlight for me uh, to see the deliberations of the Ontario Citizens Assembly on electoral reform. Great. Michael, over to you. Michael, I believe you're on mute. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, the latest uh, OECD report uh, catching the deliberative wave uh, of June of this year emphasizes the importance of embedding public decision-making in our institutions. What might this mean for reimagining democratic institutions more Well, I, I think it's important to state that, um, you know, within this deliberative wave, there are at least three different political projects. Um, and, and it's also worth stating as well that the OECD report, which I, I really recommend uh, to all of your viewers, it is a landmark report that demonstrates that there have been more than three or 400 of these processes globally over the course of the past several decades. So we're past the innovation stage already, and I think that's helpful to know. Um, but those three projects within this wave are aimed, uh, you know, in the case of mass, uh, at first the regulatory state, and using uh, all of those decisions as opportunities uh, to create a very wide platform for citizens as a matter of everyday democracy to have a hand uh, in public affairs. There is also, uh, I think, the Irish project, um, which is about using citizens' assemblies to resolve these major national issues that have been vexing to the existing political establishment. There's a third project, which we see uh, in Belgium, uh, for instance, and other jurisdictions, where there's an attempt to um, commingle these processes with that political infrastructure. So first in Ost-Belgian and just announced this week in Walloon, they are creating standing citizens assemblies, which are attached to the regional parliaments and those citizens' assemblies, importantly, have a right of initiative. That is, they get to determine uh, the topics by which other citizens' assemblies are then going to go off and examine an issue and report back to Parliament. So I, I, I think these are three complementary projects. I think they're different projects, and I, I think they each have very promising futures. And then there's an annex to all of this, which are, are is made up of those who are proponents of greater um, the, the greater use of sortition or random selection in politics, um, who, who believe that, you know, perhaps rather than elections, our parliaments ought to be populated, or at least our upper houses, uh, with randomly selected citizens. That, that's not a view that I personally uh, share, but I think, you know, democracy itself is a, an audacious project, and we always need a, a kind of propulsive sense of trying things which previously seemed unimaginable. And I, I think I, I, would, I would use that as an opportunity to, to just mention that, you know, for the better part of, you know, 200, 250 years, we have been, as, as Western democracies coming online at various times throughout that, that period, been working really at, towards a singular democratic project, and that has been the project of responsible government of the universal franchise. And it has taken at least 200 years to secure what now seems very basic, um, seems like the predicate of democracy. What do we all have? The vote. You know, I, at Mass, we, we, we refer to this as D1. This has been the first half of what I think is a much longer democratic story. And, and now we see coming into view 
the second half of the story, and, and that gets to, I think, your question. D2 is a project that will last far more than a decade or the 20 or 30 years covered by the OECD. It's a project to look at the other half of the equation, to say that if we expect that you know, all adult citizens have the right to vote, what percentage of adult citizens ought to at some point in their lives occupy some kind of public office or perhaps less formally have the opportunity to exercise public judgment? And we don't actually have a, a popularly understood ratio. We don't know whether it should be a tenth of a percent, a one percent, five percent. And that isn't to suggest that we need 3,000 member parliaments. I don't think that would be helpful. Um, but I do think we need to look at these ratios and think about opportunities for governance more widely. And that's where I think citizens' assemblies and reference panels will be useful because they can dramatically increase the opportunities for citizens to have some exposure uh, to the process of democratic governance. So I think we're going to take a slightly different direction now and bring in our viewers' questions. We've had some excellent questions in and um, start with one that I think relates to what you were talking about. Um, Michael Allen asks, Current technology permits instantaneous electronic voting. So the whole electorate could vote on any issue that currently goes before a parliament. Please discuss this option. So this is you know, digital democracy and deliberative democracy sort of head on. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, maybe using the example of the Ontario and BC Citizens Assemblies is helpful. Uh, you know, a tremendous amount of energy was put into the creation of those assemblies. Um, and part of the reason why is because electoral systems are quite complicated. And they have all kinds of, um, uh, there are all kinds of variations and, and small changes to their design can, can really have significant effects. There are different models. I think one of the compelling uh, reasons for using this assembly was that the members of it would have the opportunity to become familiar with these models and, and not just go on top of mind opinion. It was very striking in Ontario that you know they spent upwards of $5 million on that process and then a fraction of it educating the rest of the public uh, in advance of a referendum how these different electoral systems could work. So you almost had... Um, I mean, there are three uh, models of democracy at play here. You had the legislature, uh, you had the citizens' assembly, and then you had a referendum. And I think we saw just how badly the kind of gears would grind between the recommendations of the citizens' assembly and then the results of a public referendum. Personally, I, I'm not a fan of, of referenda. Um, the, the, the main reason is because I think we already exaggerate in our society the importance of voting uh, and the majoritarian instinct, uh, the idea that 50% plus one constitutes a mandate. I think voting is, is the sort of, in case of fire, break glass, fire extinguisher that we can reach to when we are genuinely at an impasse. But we've taken a mechanism that maybe ought to be held in reserve and we've pushed it to the fore. So I don't think actually we're helped by more plebiscites and popular votes about things. I, I, I don't welcome the kind of Facebookization of politics where like the Roman Fora, it's all up and down, up and down. Uh, instead, we need occasions to try and resolve our differences and find common ground with people on other sides of the issue. I always think that digital democracy ends up a little like old politics because it's about sort of how many people are liking who is shouting the loudest so um i'm very very interested to hear your comments as well on majoritarians I, I, you think I, yeah. I i i have to of course point to some of the really interesting platforms being used in countries like south korea um polis is one instance where you have a combination of um text-based dialogue and, and people being able, yes, to, to vote things up and down, but also uh, the use of analytics that draw together um, uh, shared sentiments. I think certainly with uh, the use of artificial intelligence and um, uh, some of the analytics that are being applied to vast bodies of, of um, 
comment threads, uh, it is inevitable that we are going to see an increasingly cybernetic politics. I, I, I think this can potentially create a more responsive government. I'm not sure if on the whole that it, it really fulfills the promise though of uh, democratic politics and, and that is about working out our differences with one another. Okay, uh, so we have here, Peter, a question from Christopher Keane. How do you choose the experts who will address citizens' assemblies? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the same way um, that a parliamentary uh, committee, you know, will often decide to call people forth in the same way that you know, any kind of task force that needs to become better informed about an issue. Um, I've already mentioned that we often on our most controversial projects will appoint a, a sort of independent group of above the fray uh, experts to vet that curriculum and ensure that there's no undue bias. Generally, we look for some of the most uh, senior academics in the field uh, sometimes former public servants, uh, but those who are credited uh, for their, you know, uh, thoughtfulness, their balance, um, at least initially, because they're the ones who will lay down the sort of uh, introductory presentation so that people become familiar with the terminology and the concepts and the context around the deliberation. And over the course of the four to six or more Saturdays, we will then bring in uh, people with more assertive opinions and points of view and ultimately invite advocacy groups and stakeholders related to an issue uh, to bring forward their perspectives. But it's important to us that, that people have the opportunity to first get the basics of an issue, to, to get the facts as, as much as possible, and then bring in um, more opinion, more controversy, once people have the opportunity to really be able to, to navigate these debates for themselves. And Rosemary, I think you're on mute. Okay, finally, a European question, as you might expect from GM25. Maria Eleonor van Kum Isselman asks, what are your thoughts on issue-centered democratic participation in Europe. She's thinking of Europe-wide citizens' participation in decision-making processes centered around a particular theme like immigration or water management or clean air. Well, I, I have to say that the future of European governance is well beyond this Canadian's pay grade. Um, I, I think there's obviously a, a significant challenge around democratic uh, accountability uh, with respect to, to Europe's institutions. I, I think the best thing I can do is, is direct your viewer to uh, the Democratic Society, uh, DEMSOC, a, a great organization based in Belgium that is grappling with how citizens' assemblies could play a role in European governance. Um, I, I, uh, um, I can say that, um, you know, I think for basic logistical reasons, um, I say this as a Canadian, a country with six time zones and, and three coasts and, and two official languages, uh, that these mechanisms are easiest to deploy at a regional or sub-regional level and that it certainly becomes much more costly and complex uh, to bring people together when you have to draw them uh, from a, a much larger landmass and from many more jurisdictions. Uh, but there have been some very interesting, promising multilingual uh, demonstration projects within Europe about how these uh, mechanisms could be used uh, to further some of the largest European concerns. Thank you. Do keep your questions coming in. There's some interesting questions coming in, and we will return to these in a minute. Um, I just want to squeeze in one more question of my own, if I may. Um, how do you think deliberation is really working in the COVID era. Um, you've mentioned that there is experimentation with online um, processes but, and the limits to those processes. But more broadly, I'm thinking, we often hear, you know, we're in a crisis, let's not argue, let's not have politics. Mm -hmm. 
And yet the political choices we are making now will affect both societies for generations. Mm -hmm. So how, do, how, do, how can we respond to that? Um, well, there, there are two responses. And, and one is that COVID has had the same impact on this field of practice as it has on most others, which is it has accelerated the use um, of technology and the adaptation of, of practices um, uh, online. But the second and maybe more more interesting, I hope, observation is that, you know, COVID, uh, the consequences of COVID have been born um, uh, by our societies and often those uh, who are least fortunate uh, in our societies. Um, I think it is incumbent on governments uh, to involve citizens in the development of policies to grapple uh, with the impact of COVID. You know, here in Ontario, we are finally reopening our schools. Uh, and I have to say, um, I think it would have been very well advised to have brought together a, a panel of Ontarians to uh, determine what some of the criteria ought to be uh, and some of the safeguards ought to be. I think they would have reached a very different determination uh, than what we're seeing currently and probably would have provided a, a measure of reassurance uh, to other parents and members of the public that the interests of students uh, were really first in mind. Um, beyond that, you know, there's a lot of discussion about a, a just recovery and a build back better as the Americans are saying right now. Um, we have seen uh, a few uh, proposals for citizens assemblies at a local level in the UK about COVID response and recovery. Um, I, I think these are, are uh, entirely right and appropriate. There is, there is so much to talk about right now. Um, and, and people have, have really been so profoundly affected by this uh, coronavirus. Um, we, we need to be talking about it. We need to each have a hand in thinking about what the future will look like. That said, if, if, you know, reports are to be believed by the spring, um, our societies will be able to resume, um, you know, something that looks like the normal we, um, we long for. And, and at that point, some of the, uh, the logistical challenges that exist will fall away and we'll be able to, to sit together again and, and, uh, and discuss uh, together again. And so I, I, I don't think that COVID poses a, a challenge to the deliberative wave. I think uh, as for, you know, every other uh, sphere of activity right now, it's, it's simply life interrupted. Fine. More questions. Okay. Michael. Hey, so we have a question here from uh, Marianella uh, Sklavi, who wants to know, what you think of experiences such as the Citizens' Convention for the Climate? Hmm. Well, uh, I think uh, your viewer is referring to the, uh, the French uh, Citizens' uh, Convention. And, uh, you know, it is one of a number of citizen assembly processes that have been convened to address climate change. And I think this is another instance where governments are turning to these assemblies to create a mandate uh, outside of the electoral process um, and where citizens assemblies can uh, be very helpful uh, in uh, helping to advance these issues where, you know, as we see just based on public opinion surveys, often uh, the wider public is clamoring for action and for various reasons parliaments um, aren't able uh, to, to secure the votes that they need to, to move ahead. You know, it's interesting that the Convention Nationale came out of um, France's experience with the Yellow Vests and Emmanuel Macron decided, first of all, that there would be a, um, a national citizens dialogue that didn't have the structure of an assembly, but one of the recommendations that came out of those discussions was the need for an assembly. Um, he has certainly been very complimentary about the convention's deliberations. Uh, he's pledged to take up many of their recommendations. He's engaged directly with the members, bringing them to Belize Palace. Uh, and I think uh, it, is a, it is a tremendous precedent for France. 
you know, I think there's a, a, a significant difference, however, between um, government commission processes like we've seen in France and also in the UK, the parliamentary uh, citizens assembly, which just reported last week in the UK about climate change. I think there's a very big difference between those processes and uh, the assemblies that are called for by uh, advocacy groups like Extinction Rebellion. I can certainly appreciate why uh, they would like to see a citizens assembly created. I think it's open question as to whether advocacy groups and movements can run assemblies that will um, have the same public legitimacy as state-sponsored uh, processes. And I, I don't say that with any judgment in mind. I, I think it's actually a really interesting empirical question. Uh, but there's no, there, there's no doubt in my mind, I mean, we ran a reference panel for the City of Toronto about its climate action strategy uh, that given just how um, serious the existential threat is of climate change, just how far reaching the interventions that are required, uh, climate is a, 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 very, um, a very key issue for citizens' assemblies to take up. And I think we will see dozens, if not hundreds more of these processes examine the issue for the purpose of creating some political propulsion uh, in the months and years ahead. That's very interesting in relation to a question that's just sort of come in, which says, how can we attract citizens to um, a major, broader form of direct participation in society? And the Extinction Rebellion example is a good one, isn't it? Because you could say that that does get a lot more people literate and expectant about these sorts of processes. But as you say, there's a tension there between that and establishing the reputation of the Deliberative Assembly as something that can really be entrusted with major political decisions. And that raises another question that's come in, which is, would you trust citizens' assemblies with the final say in political mm -hmm. decisions? So it depends where on this spectrum one's hoping the impact is, is going to be, it seems to me. Yes, I, I, I suppose it does. I mean, um, I, I think it's important not to exoticize citizens' assemblies uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, public judgment uh, is socially constructed uh, and it, it can be found through so many different mechanisms. Um, I think there are instances where the sort of arm's length relationship, the distance that a citizen's assembly might have to an issue um, might make it an appropriate mechanism um, by which to, to render a verdict uh, on an issue. I'm, I'm thinking about political conflicts of interests, um, for instance. After all, I mean, this is no different than our jury system um, with respect to criminal justice. And, you know, really it is about uh, scaling up one of the, the oldest of uh, democratic mechanisms that actually precedes uh, the vote and our elected legislatures. And, and that's the coroner's jury. You know, it's been the case since the 13 or 1400s uh, in the UK that a coroner's jury was made up of, uh, if not randomly selected citizens, then a range of citizens who would investigate wrongful death. And this is still a, a, a very important part of our, our modern um, judicial system. Uh, here in Canada, you know, in the case of a tragic and wrongful death, citizens are impaneled. And they will, in a non-adversarial courtroom process, hear from a range of experts and ultimately make recommendations to industry, to government, and to society as a whole. Um, so, you know, we, we have in various ways used these principles and mechanisms to deal with important social issues for some time. Um, you know, I, I don't think, I, I'm, I'm always careful here, and maybe to your point, Rosemary, about Extinction Rebellion, I, I, I don't think citizens' assemblies are the answer to our democratic malaise. Uh, I don't want to be a solutionist that says, well, if we, if we just sow the seeds of a thousand citizens' assemblies, then there will be this fluorescence of civic activity. Um, I think they are specialized tools. And yes, we could see dozens or hundreds of them in the UK or in Canada each year, and it would still only make a dent in 
the uh, broader democratic culture. So we need popular movements like XR, uh, and we, we need uh, a strong civil society. We need the democratization of our workplaces. We need a human rights agenda that grapples with the inequities within families. You know, there are so many democratic opportunities for us, and citizens' assemblies only serve one of them. That's really a rather marvellous note, I think, on which to wind up what I hope is only a first chapter in our debate with you, Peter. And I'm going to hand over to Michael now, too. Thank you, Robin. Uh, yes, Peter, it's been a great pleasure to have you uh, join us on uh, DM25 TV today. Um, and I, you know, I hope this uh, engenders uh, more discussion and that we can uh, invite you back at a future date. Uh, so, uh, just with um, that in mind, uh, I'd just like to remind viewers of our Deliberative Democracy DSC uh, on the September the 22nd, uh, and you will find that advertised on the DM25 forum. Uh, back to you, Rosemary. Thank you all very much, and thank you for your attendance and your questions, which we intend to carry on answering, so we do invite you to involved. Also, if you've enjoyed this session, please make sure you subscribe to DM25 social media channels and maybe consider making a donation. The link to donate is in the description of the live stream video on YouTube. Lastly, I'd like to thank David Castro and the DM25 team who made this fascinating exchange possible and to wish everyone a very good day. <laughs>